This video is going to be your first introduction to the endocrine system. So I'm going to cover some basics of it, some structure stuff, some hormone stuff, so that you are set up to be able to understand the system as we continue through it over the next couple of weeks. The first thing that I would say about the endocrine system is its function, what it actually does in the body, is very similar to that of the nervous system in that it coordinates and it regulates all body activities. So that may cause you to question why we need both of these systems, and here's why. The nervous system can have really rapid effects, and the reason for that is all the nervous system has to do is send an electrical signal that basically travels at the speed of light down a neuron and release hormone onto an organ to cause its effects, to be able to regulate things that are going on in the body. So the nervous system is really, really rapid with its effects. However, you guys know at this point that once a neurotransmitter has been released and once it's had its effect, it's either broken down or it goes through reuptake. And either way, it's taken out of the synapse and once it's out of the synapse, it's no longer able to have its effects on the cell that it was targeting. So the effects of the nervous system are really, really quick, but they are also short-lived. The endocrine system is a little bit slower. So the endocrine system consists of organs that release chemicals known as hormones into the blood, and those chemicals travel through the blood to control and regulate and have effects on organs that are in other areas of the body. So because we're using the blood as a medium to transport hormones, when we have hormones being released in the body, their effects are a little bit delayed. They're not immediate because it takes some time for that hormone to travel through the blood to get to the organ it's trying to affect. However, because these hormones are released into the bloodstream, it takes a lot longer for them to be broken down. So when you have an endocrine system controlling and regulating things that are going on in the body, the effects are delayed, but they are also prolonged. So when we combine the nervous system and the endocrine system, and we have both working together, we're able to get both immediate effects and prolonged effects in controlling and regulating things that are happening in the body. So I wanna talk about some basic anatomy before we get too deep into the endocrine system and talk about an endocrine gland versus an exocrine gland. Up to this point, you've learned about some glands in the body. So we talked about sweat glands and oil glands in the skin back when we were in the integumentary system. And sweat glands and oil glands are examples of exocrine glands. The reason for this is both of these gland types release their product into a duct. So if you look at this diagram that we have here of the skin, You'll notice there is a little sweat gland sitting down there in the skin and there is a duct that comes off of it and the sweat gland produces the sweat, it releases it into the duct and the duct is going to transport that sweat to where the body needs it, which is on the surface of the skin. With endocrine organs, it's a little bit different. So here's the thyroid gland here. It's a butterfly shaped endocrine organ that sits in your neck and produces some hormones. And it's an endocrine gland because it doesn't have a duct. So if you look at its structure, there's no tube, there's no duct that's coming off of it anywhere into which it can release its hormone. What endocrine organs do instead is if you look at them microscopically, they're very vascular. So here's an artist's representation of that. We've got the cells that make up the thyroid or some of the cells that make up the thyroid. And you'll notice we've got this extensive network of blood vessels that are running through them. So all of these thyroid gland cells have to do, and this is true for all endocrine organs, is release the product outside of the cell, it diffuses into the bloodstream, and then the bloodstream is able to transport that chemical, that hormone, to all the tissues of the body. This is really actually maybe a superior way to do things, because if you think about the blood, it is in very close contact with all of the living cells of the body. So an endocrine organ has an opportunity to get its product to effectively every cell in the body by using the blood as a transport medium, whereas an exocrine gland can only release its product to a very specific place because it's releasing the product through a duct. 
So that's the difference between endocrine glands and exocrine glands. And the endocrine system consists of endocrine organs. So these organs in the body that are producing hormones and releasing them directly into the blood as opposed to into a duct system. Another kind of basic thing that I want to get out of the way as we're first learning about this particular system is I want to talk somewhat about the chemistry of hormones. Some textbooks that you'll read will get into this and make it really complicated. I want to make it really simple because simple is all we need for understanding what we need to understand in this class about the chemistry of hormones. Almost all of the hormones in the body, or I really should say all of the hormones in the body, fall into one of two classifications chemically. So we have, first of all, steroid hormones, and this is the minority of hormones. And the steroid hormones include the sex hormones. So this is estrogen and progesterone in females, testosterone in males, and two other hormones. Aldosterone is a steroid hormone, and cortisol is a steroid hormone. The reason that they are referred to as steroid hormones is because they are fats based on their chemical structure. So if you look over here, up here in the top corner of this diagram, we've got an artist's representation of the chemical structure of cortisol. So cortisol, again, is one of those steroid hormones. All of our steroid hormones have this four ring structure to them. And the reason for that is they are all synthesized from cholesterol. So they are basically products of cholesterol. They look very similar to cholesterol chemically because of that. The other thing that you should know about these steroid hormones is because they are fats, they are not water soluble. So they do not get into the blood, which is mostly water, and diffuse in there nicely and be transported along in the blood. And we'll nicely, we'll talk about that later, how they accommodate for that. All of the other hormone categories, at least chemically speaking, I like to classify as just non-steroid. So if you look over here at this diagram, we've got an artist's representation of some other hormone types that would fall in the non-steroid categories. Parathyroid hormone is a protein. Oxytocin down here is a polypeptide chain. This is prostaglandin, another hormone. You can see it's made up largely of a hydrocarbon chain. So all of these other chemical structures that aren't based off of cholesterol, I like to just refer to as non-steroid hormones. They are water soluble. So they get into the blood. They like to be in a watery environment. They're transported through the blood nicely because blood is mostly water and they're perfectly comfortable in a watery environment. So again, those are our non-steroid hormones, which is everything besides the sex hormones, aldosterone and cortisol. So we've talked about what endocrine organs are. We've talked about the fact that they release these chemicals that go into the blood and the blood transports them to other cells of the body. And these chemicals are known as hormones. And these hormones have effects when they get to other cells in the body that have receptors for them. So what I wanna do with this particular slide is talk about what causes an endocrine organ to release its hormone because endocrine organs are not always just producing hormone and releasing hormone into the blood. There has to be a stimulus that causes them to go about releasing hormone. So there are three different types of stimuli that will cause endocrine glands to release hormones. Some endocrine organs respond to one of these stimuli types. Others respond to other stimuli types. The first is what's known as humoral stimuli. And I'm gonna give you kind of a mouthful um, definition of what humoral stimuli is, and then I'll give you a couple of examples that maybe actually you're already familiar with. So humoral stimuli occurs when an alteration in the concentration of a specific substance in body fluids causes hormone release. So here's what this is saying basically in real terms using an example that you may already be familiar with. When we have an increase in sugar in the blood, when blood glucose levels increase, this causes insulin to be released. And insulin is released through humoral stimuli. So here's how. An alteration in the concentration of a specific substance, the specific substance that we're talking about is glucose in body fluids. The body fluid is blood, causes hormone release. 
and the hormone is insulin. So that's a good example of humoral stimuli there that you may already be familiar with. We also looked at an example of humoral stimuli back when we were looking at the skeletal system and looking at blood calcium regulation. You may remember when we were in that section that we learned about a couple of hormones, calcitonin and parathyroid hormone, and that parathyroid hormone is released by the parathyroid gland when blood calcium levels become too low. So in that case, the specific substance is calcium. Its concentration has decreased in the blood, which is a body fluid, and that caused parathyroid hormone to be released. So those are two examples of hormones that are released by humoral stimuli. Another type of stimuli that we'll see that some endocrine organs respond to is what's known as neural stimuli. And in this case, it's actually nerve fibers that are stimulating the organ and causing it to release its hormone. So the adrenal glands are a good example of this. You've all probably been in a situation that scared you. Maybe you almost got in a car wreck or something else happened. And you know how you get kind of that pounding in your heart because you've got an adrenaline release, right? The way that this happens is when some type of emergency occurs in your life, the brain is gonna send signals through neurons down to the adrenal glands, telling the adrenal glands it's time to release adrenaline. So adrenaline through the adrenal glands is a good example of a hormone that's released through neural stimuli. The last type of stimuli is actually the most common. So most endocrine organs respond to hormonal stimuli and release their uh, hormones when they get that hormonal stimuli. And this basically occurs when one hormone released by a different endocrine gland travels to another endocrine gland and tells it to release its hormone. So again, this is the most common type of stimuli that leads to hormone release. In our next folder that we get to on the endocrine system, we're gonna look at a lot of this because the hypothalamus and the pituitary um, work a lot through this hormonal stimuli. So once hormones are released, you guys know we've talked about they get into the blood and then the blood transports them to the cells of the body and certain cells in the body are considered to be target cells for that hormone because they have a receptor for the hormone. All other cells are exposed to the hormone when it's in the blood, but if they don't have a receptor on their surface for that specific hormone, they don't respond to the hormone. What I wanna do now is talk about how these hormones get from the endocrine organ where they're released to the target organ where they have their effects. And there's a couple of different ways that this can happen. So both water-soluble hormones, that's our non-steroidal hormones, and lipid-soluble hormones, those are our steroid hormones, are released from endocrine organs and make their way into the bloodstream. Our non-steroidal hormones, remember, are water-soluble and the blood's mostly water. So those non-steroidal hormones are perfectly happy, just dissolved in the blood, floating along. They like being in that watery environment until they get to a cell that has a receptor for them and then they bind to that cell. Lipid soluble hormones, so that's our steroid hormones that are based off of cholesterol, do not like watery environments. So they're not water soluble. They don't just diffuse into the bloodstream and happily be transported along in the bloodstream. Instead, what happens with these fat soluble hormones or these steroid hormones is they get into the blood and they have to actually bind to proteins in the plasma to make them soluble so that they can be transported in the blood and reach their target organs. So here's our last slide, kind of basics to the endocrine system where I wanna talk just a little bit more about the target cells for a particular hormone. I mentioned with our last slide that cells are exposed to hormones in the blood because all cells, at least living cells in the body, have a close contact relationship with the blood. However, only certain cells in the body have receptors for a particular hormone and are thus able to respond to the hormone. And when we're talking about a cell that does have receptors for a particular hormone, we refer to that as a target cell. If you look at this picture that I've drawn over here, here's my representation of a cell. And I'm saying that each one of these little purple things on the outside of it is a receptor for insulin. 
So this would be a cell that's a target cell for insulin because it has receptors for insulin on its outside surface. One of the things that you should know about receptors for hormones is they can downregulate, meaning that they can decrease the number, their numbers on the outside of a cell that they're found on, or they can upregulate, meaning that they can increase their numbers on the outside of a cell that they're found on. Receptors will downregulate when they are exposed to chronically high levels of the hormone that they bind. They will upregulate when they're exposed to chronically low levels of the hormone they bind. And this, believe it or not, is really what's responsible for the type 2 diabetes mellitus um, problem that we have in our country right now. And here's why. So type 2 diabetes mellitus is the adult onset diabetes. It is almost always linked to dietary and lifestyle factors. And this is the reason why. If you are not careful about what you eat, so if you eat too many simple carbohydrates or you eat entirely carbohydrates and you don't combine them with fats and proteins and things like that that are going to prevent your blood sugar from spiking, then what happens is all of that sugar as it's broken down by the digestive system gets released into the blood and it spikes your blood sugar. And when your blood sugar is high, insulin's released by the body. And if your blood sugar is always high because you're always eating or you're not eating smartly and doing things to prevent blood sugar spikes, then what happens is that the cells on target cells for insulin will downregulate their receptors. So they will actually physically decrease the number of their receptors for insulin on the outside of the cell. What that does is it makes the cell less responsive to insulin so that when you have insulin being released, there aren't as many target cells for, or target cell receptors for it to bind to, and that prevents insulin from having its effects. It isn't able to clear the sugar from the blood. If that's the case, blood sugar stays higher for longer and it causes the damage associated with high blood sugar, which basically damages every single organ of the body because it's damaging to the bloodstream. When you're in a down-regulated state, that is what type 2 diabetes is. It's because your cells have down-regulated, they're not as responsive to insulin, they're not able to clear sugar from the blood when your insulin is released, and now you may de be dependent on medications like metformin or even insulin itself where you have to give yourself injections to try and up insulin levels to clear sugar from the blood. I mentioned before that the other thing that can happen if cells are exposed to chronically low levels of a hormone is they can upregulate the receptors on their cell surface, which is going to make them more responsive to that particular hormone. There are people that have reverse type 2 diabetes mellitus through upregulation of their cells. In order to upregulate the receptors, you would have to decrease the chronically high insulin levels in your blood that are being caused by overeating, that are being caused by not eating smartly, so eating too many simple sugars, um, eating too, uh, too often, not exercising, doing those things that are going to help to clear sugar from the blood. So if you start doing those things so that your blood sugar isn't so high, your insulin levels will go down. If your insulin levels go down, now you might see your cells starting to upregulate to even where they may get to the point where they're responsive to insulin again at normal levels and you no longer have type 2 diabetes mellitus.